All right, this is gymnastics. Everybody stand up again. I always stand in the honor of God's word. And tonight, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 23. Luke, chapter 23. And we'll take our text again in verse 33. Three days that changed history. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you. We thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to be in your house again tonight so that we can hear your word. Father, there may be one here tonight or two or even more that really don't know the story, really don't understand all the implications about what happened at Calvary. And I pray tonight will be that night that they'll fully understand. I pray, Holy Spirit, open up the hearts and minds of men and women, boys and girls. Help us to hear from you tonight. We thank you for what you're going to do already. Thank you most of all for loving us and saving us. In your precious sweet name we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, tell somebody you love them before you sit down there. That's exactly what Calvary means, that the Lord Jesus loves you. I know the devil wants to make you think that there's no love for you. That how could the Lord love you with the things that you've done in your life? I know this because the devil does it to me also. He does it to us all. But I'm here to tell you that the Lord Jesus looks over all of that once we're saved and he loves us and he loves you tonight and he wants you to know him that's the reason in this time and in this season that a lot of preachers will preach on the cross and the resurrection but I enjoy preaching on the cross and the resurrection anytime because it is what Jesus did for me so that I could have free from sin and go to heaven to be with him one day you see there's only one way to go to heaven the only way to heaven tonight is through Jesus Christ he is the way the truth and the life this morning we started this sermon and I'm not going to recap but I just want to give you just a gist of where that I feel that you need to know tonight so that we can go on and finish the sermon when this scene that I just read out of verse 33 when this scene was happening there was a lot of different emotions surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and some of those emotions come in different forms some of them are about people just people in Luke chapter 23, verse 27, it says, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented over him. In Luke 23, 35, it says, And the people stood beholding, looking at him. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. In Luke 23, 39, it says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. In this scene here, we see that there was blaspheming, there was cursing Jesus Christ, there was a mocking Jesus, scoffing at him, and making fun of the claims that he said he was the Messiah. 
In Luke 23, 47, it says, But there was one that said, and when he, the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Two different types of people. There was people there that was crying because of what was going on and couldn't handle all of the emotion of what they were doing to Jesus. There was some there that just hated the Lord Jesus Christ, everything about him. They hated that he claimed to be the Messiah. The Jews, uh, on the most part, hated him and hung him there. And then there was this centurion. There's a difference about this man because this man was in charge. This man was in the high order of things. He had a hundred men under him. He wasn't just somebody that was just thrown in the mix. He was a person that was in authority. He was a Roman. And when he looked at Jesus, he saw something different in him. And tonight, if you're here, I want you to see something different in him. Because all this time that you've been alive, you've heard about Jesus, you've talked about Jesus, you've seen people that serve Jesus, but you just really never got it. And you may be here tonight and God is going to speak to you, I promise, because the Holy Spirit said he'd never let us down, and I believe that. He said the word would never go out void, and I believe that. They were overcome with grief, some of them. They witnessed this and looked at it and beheld it, and uh, some were scoffing and gambling for his clothes, and the criminals were cursing him, but the centurion was praising him. Then there was things at the cross that were unrelated to people. We see that in Luke 23, 44. Here's some of the powerful things that happened at the cross of Calvary. And it was about the sixth hour, and there were darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. In other words, in the mid of the day, it just got totally dark. That was a phenomenon. I mean, it never happened like that before, never happened since. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, the earth became dark. Some other things happened. In Matthew, he gives us an account of an earthquake at the cross. He says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. There was an earthquake. And then in Luke 23, 45, it says during that time that the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. It was torn in two. That is a very big implication there. We talked about that this morning. We will not talk about it again tonight. But as these people, whether it was the cause of it and whether it was the people standing there, it was for the people that followed Christ, demoralizing to see the one that they serve hanging on a cross. Because to hang on the cross meant that you was a criminal, that you were wicked, that you were sinful, that you were this, that you had done murder, or some of the things that were awful, like in our day and time. And they hung them on the cross so that everyone could see them. But the thing with Jesus is he did nothing. Nothing but be the Son of God. It was discouraging to some of the people that had followed him. It was depressing. It was dark. Then you have these disciples, the emotions of the disciples who had followed Jesus roughly three years. They were unable to understand why this would happen to the one that they dearly loved and dearly followed. They had heard it time and time again, but it just hadn't sunk into them. So at the cross, there was mocking and cursing and all kinds of emotion. People were sorrowful. There was indifference. There was praising from the centurion. And there was some of them that just stood by and watched. But it was the day that everything changed. Nothing would ever be the same after the cross of Calvary. Lives wouldn't be the same after the cross of Calvary because there was a decision had to be made. You see, after the cross of Calvary, 
And after Jesus died on the cross, and then we all know next week we'll talk about the resurrection, after the resurrection, after Jesus ascended, but after he did all of these things, then salvation's plan was put into place. Everything was in order. He was the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus had never sinned. He was the only one that could take the sins of the whole world upon himself. He was the only one. Nobody else. And I want you to know here tonight, even though our country says there's all these other gods and all these other ways of following things, I want you to know tonight that Jesus settled it on the cross of Calvary. It's settled. And because it's settled, then after the cross, there had to be a decision. That decision comes down to you and me. You see, I cannot be saved for you, and you cannot be saved for me. I cannot be saved because my dad was saved and my mom was saved. I can only be saved because I accept what Jesus did on the cross for me. I accept his blood as a payment for my sins, and his blood is the only thing that can make my old dark heart white as pure snow. And I accept that tonight. There's only two decisions to make after the cross. There's the decision that you can say, I will not accept what Jesus did for me on the cross, and you will die, believe me, because we all die. Every one of us in this church will die. I'm looking for the rapture, aren't you? but will die. It's appointed unto men once to die, and then after this is the judgment. That's what the Bible says. So we're all going to die. And we need to make a decision before we die, because look at me tonight. If we do not make that decision before we die to accept Christ, then there's only one place and one place only that we go, and that's hell. And it's real. But if we're saved, Jesus said that we'll go to heaven with him forevermore. What a wonderful, beautiful story, but there's only two decisions to make. I'm so glad that many years ago I made the decision to follow Christ. But that day everything changed. At first everyone was in shock about what had just happened. I used the scenario this morning of 9-11 when that happened, how that, you know, we all just sat there and watched as our country was being attacked and things just fell apart and we had emotions of, of all different sorts. And the same thing was happening here with all of these people. They were just in shock. They experienced uh, various reactions to what just had happened on the cross of Calvary. And as we just talked about a minute ago, some of those reactions were they were perplexed. They were frightened. They were uh, experiencing disbelief. They were experiencing doubt. They were confused. And then on the other hand, they were marveling and praising. I mean, there was all kinds of things going on there. The ones that understood what Jesus was doing was praising him. In Luke 24, 11, it puts it this way because Luke writes about the disciples after having heard the story that these women that had come back to them had told them were moving forward a little bit after they went to the tomb. And in Luke 24, 11, it says, And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. These were the disciples. These were the ones that had followed them all this time, followed Jesus all this time. The disciples had followed him, and now here they were, and they were, they were perplexed and didn't believe what they had to say. Even though they had walked with him, even though they had been with him and probably heard it many times, they still didn't believe. When Jesus appeared then to them, he walked in the room as they were discussing what the 
what in the world was going on. And in Luke 24, 36, here's what he said. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Look at the response even after he does this. Look at the response as we looked at this morning, Luke 24, 37. It says, but they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Why, are your, why do these thoughts arise in your heart? You knew what was going to happen. I've told you. It's kind of an amazing thing to me that people can come to church Sunday in and Sunday out and still leave and say, I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. After the Holy Spirit has touched our hearts several times over the years and the Holy Spirit has convicted them of their sins and convicted them of their life and they still leave and say, I don't believe it. Jesus said, why are you troubled? Why do these thoughts even arise in your hearts? And the, then Jesus said, I'll give you proof. It's an amazing thing that he had to show him proof. But he did. And you know what? He did that because he loves them. Just like he loves us. Amen. Just like he cares for us. He understands that we're human. He understands that we're weak. He understands tonight that we need Him more than anything else in life. He says in verses 39 and 40 in, verse, in chapter 24, Behold my hands and my feet, that, is, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands, and he showed them his feet. Look, he said, it's me. The ones of you that were standing there beholding me on the cross. The ones of you that saw me crucify. The ones of you that saw me die on the cross. The ones of you that saw all of this. Look! And see that it's real. And see that it's true. And I'm here to tell you tonight, look! Because when you take a look, a real look at Jesus, you will know that everything He says is truth. And everything he says is real. Look at Jesus. And that's why we're here tonight. Because we want you to take a look at Jesus. The second and last thing is the emotions that they are experiencing. And we talked a little bit about this in different characteristics. But I want to narrow it down now. I suppose the verse that best captures the emotions and the mindsets of all those that witness this is the following. It's found in Luke chapter 24, verses four, verse 41, and it says there, And while they yet believed not, for joy and wondered. Now, I know that may not mean a lot to you, but that's a big statement there. They had emotions. What kind of emotions did they have after this, after they uh, saw him? They had some emotions. What were they? They had emotions of disbelief still. They had emotions of joy. They had emotions of amazements. And at the same time, they realized that this changes everything. And, and they said, look what has happened it's kind of like us when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. When the Holy Spirit is, is dealing with us. Have you ever had different emotions when the Holy Spirit is dealing with you? Sometimes you feel sad. Sometimes you have joy. Sometimes you just can't help but shout. Sometimes you can't help but raise your hand. I mean, you just have different emotions of, uh, of different things go on. And sometimes you have all of them. Because our body, listen, this old body that, that we have, we, we can't sometimes handle what Jesus does in us and through us and with us. And some of you know what I'm talking about tonight. Some of you have been right there when you're on your knees praying and when you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will just hit you with a verse of Scripture and you can't help but shout. You can't help but cry. You can't help but say amen, hallelujah. I mean, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The same thing had happened to them. They 
First believed not, and then they had joy, and then they wondered. And Jesus, these are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you. He said, I've told you what was going to happen, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. We understand. Isn't it amazing? Do you remember when you finally understood? I, I mean, it was just like that it just opened my heart and opened. I got it what I'm supposed to be because how many of you know we're all he lives inside of my heart and I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit does that's what Jesus does in your heart he said I spake to you these words I told you all the things that were going to happen and you didn't believe then their understanding he opened it and they understood the scriptures Everything Jesus started to say to them now was making sense. They are, they're now putting all pieces together. Uh, they're covered in this righteousness and this understanding of God and how good He really is. You know, in His life here on this earth, He was wonderful. He was good. He never did anything. He never sinned. He never did anything. But listen, now He lives on the inside of them. What a miracle that Jesus lives on the inside of us tonight. That He's there with us all the time. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He's a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. People in this world don't understand why that in the stressful times and the heartache times and the times of, uh, of stress and pain and, and, and funerals and all of this, how that we can still have that peace. There's no peace without Jesus. There's no peace without Him. Everything started making sense to these men. And, and then look what he says here in verses 46 through 48. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. He's saying here, he's saying now, preach the gospel. Go out, win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that ought to be us tonight. Because of what Jesus has done in our heart, because of how he has saved us and bought us and forgave us, we ought to be the ones on the front line tonight winning people to Jesus. It's written that Christ needed to suffer. He needed to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. And I'm here to tell you, there is a way. And his name is Jesus. You can leave here tonight. You can leave here no matter what you've done, where you've been, what you've said, how many times you've rejected Christ. Listen to me tonight. He's still willing to save you right now. And he will save you. Come unto me, he said. You want to know why he said that and why we sing even that song and say that? The reason is because he's the only one we can come to. There's no one else can forgive your sins. Oh, but preacher, I think I'll just try this and try that. I'll try, you know, this and, and that, and I'll just work my way in and work my way up. Folks, let me tell you something. He did it all. There's nothing you can do to be saved tonight. He did it all. He accomplished everything. That is why the message of the cross is that men and women and, and boys and girls and children should repent. I remember that, being proud. Not wanting nobody to know that I wasn't good like they thought I was. Didn't want anybody at church. And I was proud, and that kept me.
from giving my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. To me, Jesus knows everything anyway. Jesus knows everything about you. And it's an altar, and I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way you do him, or a quarter of it to him. You've got to give it all, or three quarters. You've got to give it all. This little thing that, that I love, I want to keep it in my heart. God says, no, you've got to give it all. The message of the cross. It was all done. The gospel message of the church, of this church, is the death, burial, and resurrection. And it's essential that you accept Jesus Christ. It's essential or you cannot go to heaven. And I pray tonight that God is touching your heart through heaven. Repent. You say, what does that mean? That means that you give your sin and forgive me of uh, my sins. And he will forgive you. You can't do this in your own strength. But my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until... Uh, it's the next excuse that you will use. You'll say to you in yourself and through yourself, I can't do this. Only Jesus Christ can live th that we know that's not godly, not uh, a Christian. A lot of times people play act. They want to live the life. To live for Him. To those of His children, He'll give to you. When you confess Jesus to me through the Holy Spirit, and I live my daily life by faith. Faith! In Jesus Christ. Paul said uh, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power, listen, to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. What kind of power is he talking about here? He's talking about power tonight for you and me to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Power to resist temptation. It's not the temptation that gets us. It's giving in to the temptation. God gives us the power to resist. How many understand that and believe that tonight? He gives us power to restore relationships. Uh, power to get set free from sin tonight. I'm talking about alcohol and drugs and, and all this uh, wickedness in this world. He gives you power through the Holy Spirit to, to, to live in this life without it. To live in this life without these sins that overwhelm us and overtake us. Oh, will we fall sometimes? Will we trip sometimes? Sure, we're human. But thank God He's there to pick us up and dust us off. These disciples, this is what they experienced. These people, this is what they experienced after Jesus rose from the dead. In Luke 24, 52 through 53, it says... As he started to ascend into heaven and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. You see, listen to me. He went back to heaven, but he still lived in their hearts. And that's what we have tonight. He lives inside of us. He's here with us. He will go with us and talk for us and help us to be a witness to the world that is lost. That's what Jesus does for us. And they worshipped him in verse 52. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually, continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. They were covered in joy. They were covered in praise. Just a few hours ago, just a few months ago, just a few days ago, they were in disbelief and they were depressed and they were confused and they were all this, but now they're living in joy and living in praise and living in happiness. Why? Because Jesus now lives in their heart. He is alive. And he's alive forevermore. And he lives within my heart. And if you're saved tonight, he lives within 
your heart. Everything had changed in these disciples' life now. And this change was for the good. Look at what Jesus said about this. Jesus said that now that they had the Holy Spirit, now that the Holy Spirit is coming in our hearts, in our life, listen to what He does for us. He said, now when Jesus comes into our heart through the Holy Spirit, we step from death into life. We step from damnation to salvation. We step from chaos to peace, from pain and heartache to joy and praise. That's who we have tonight in our heart, and that's what He's done for us. In ending this service tonight, I want to say to you, this could be the very night that Jesus changes you and shows you how to live. You'll never do it by your own strength. You can fight as long as you want to fight, and you can be mad as long as you want to be mad about the truth, but I'm here to tell you, you can never do it by yourself. Not in your strength. Salvation only comes through the power of the resurrection. Because He lives, we live tonight. This could be the day that changes how you view life. Some people live life for their own purposes, but I'm here to tell you, once Jesus saves you, you live for God's purposes. You live for what He wants and for His glory. You see, the transformation of these people that I talked about throughout this whole sermon, you see the transformation, the praise, the joy from guilt and, and, and depression and all that took place before. And now, they know what the true meaning of life is. I'm glad tonight that I know what the true meaning of life is. I'm glad tonight that I will lay my head down on my pillow, and you know what? I'm not worried about dying anymore. I don't worry a bit about leaving this life because you know why? I have Jesus in my heart. And folks, there is nothing in this world like that. Nothing. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this old world has to offer. And I'm glad tonight that I'm saved but you may be here tonight and you don't know Jesus. I want you to bow your head just for a moment. I want to introduce you to Him. You see, in this story tonight, you had to see what had to happen to Him so that you could be saved. And the old devil will come to you right now and say, you know, why would He do that for you? Why, why would He even die on the cross for you? Why, why would He give his life for you and shed his blood for you because listen folks listen to me tonight he loves you he loves you there's nobody in this world or out of this world that loves you like Jesus loves you and tonight he came to die for your sins all of us have to admit tonight we're sinners all of us are Jesus came to die for your sins. And what you have to do is you have to ask Jesus into your heart, just like everybody else. I can't do it for you. I had to do it for myself. You have to do it for yourself. How do I do that, preacher? Well, first of all, you know tonight, through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, if God is dealing with you, you say, how do you know that your heart is absolutely beating out of your chest tonight? I mean, you know because the Holy Spirit is telling you you're not right, you're not saved. And, but don't you want to be? This Easter season, wouldn't it be great that you would come to an old-fashioned altar and let some 
preacher bow down with you and show you in the scripture how to be saved. And you, you can get up from this altar tonight and leave this church and know that you know that you know that if you died before you got home tonight that you'd be in heaven with Jesus. What a great gift that he's given us. And tonight you're here and God is dealing with you right now. I'm going to ask you to do something. I will not come back to you. I will not embarrass you. We don't do that here. If the Lord can't get you to where you need to be, I sure can't. But if you're here tonight and God is dealing with you on your lost condition, or He's dealing with you on repenting, there's something in your life that He's dealing with you on, you need to take care of that tonight, here's what we're going to do right now. First thing I want to do, if you're here tonight and you know you're lost and you know that if you died right now, you wouldn't go to heaven, I want to pray for you. I don't know your name, maybe. And I'm not going to come back to you, but I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Would you care enough about your eternal life to say, preacher, please pray for me. God has spoke to me tonight and I just need prayers. Would you please pray for me? If that's you tonight, nobody's looking around but me, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. 